Hi, welcome back to the lab sessions, the programming lab sessions of the Foundations of Machine Learning Lecture. Today we will have a look at evaluation metrics. This notebook is sort of built to extend the lecture. So if you have already seen the lecture on evaluating effectiveness, you will heard, have heard a lot about why you would do evaluation, what is it good for, and also a lot of the sort of theoretical foundations um, of error calculation. What this lab session here tries to address is that you didn't really get to know concrete measures for evaluating things. And so what we will have a look at is four different met metrics for evaluating a classification task. In the first half of this lab session, we will take a look at the binary case. So classifying whether something is wrong or right, true, false, negative, positive, whatever you want to name it. And then in the second part, we will extend the setting to multi-class classification. We don't have two classes, but up to an infinite amount of them. For example, if you were to classify a picture into which animal it contains, you could have horses, cats, dogs, you name it. So the very first thing, as you already know from also the um, other lab sessions you already uh, worked on, the programming labs, we have this first import thing. And this is also the first time we see sklearn popping up here. You already know about NumPy. Pandas is only here because we sometimes want to pretty print things. You can ignore this for now. You can solve everything in here without Pandas. I just use it so it looks better on the recording. And sklearn, however, is something you also need to import. Um, these snippets should already be contained in the exercise notebook, so you don't have to type them out. Um, what this will do is that in all the this one and also the subsequent lab sessions, we sort of try to re-implement what sklearn does. sklearn is a very popular uh, Python machine learning framework, and we want to give you a behind-the-scenes look of how sklearn achieves machine learning. And in this case, we want to have a closer look at sklearn metrics. So these are the four that I will talk about in this lab session. This one is actually not important for us right now, um, but might come in handy in the future. So that's why it is here as reference. Um, we want to, however, here have only look at uh, accuracy as precision at recall and at the F1 score. You don't really need this S statement. This just makes it available under a different name because we also want to implement a function later that is called accuracy score. So in order to circumvent the problem of having two things named the same, we just rename them into something with an SK prefix. So we know exactly this is the sklearn um, option for evaluating accuracy. Let's ex execute this cell and we can jump right in to the binary classification setting. So what we want to explore here is the example that you want to build a machine learning classifier that decides if a mail is spam or not. So a mail arrives in your inbox, and I think most mail programs have the option of automatically flagging if this mail is somewhat suspicious or if you should read it. And we have given 10 different mails down here with associated labels. The one at the top is our true label. So this is the ground truth, for example, annotated by a human or by yourself. And the Y thread, so the predicted version, is what your machine learning classifier that we hypothetically built before um, predicts for each given mail. And these two are aligned. So the first index here is our first mail, and it's also the first index over here. So as you can have a look, our machine learning classifier agrees uh, with our ground truth data in the most cases. However, we have a few cases where it either misses a classification, so it predicts that it, something is not spam when it actually should be spam, or should be classified as spam because it is, or it detects spam where indeed there is none. So the task for us is to quantify into a number if this classifier is correct. Can we somehow calculate a number that tells us how good the output of our classifier is? And this is exactly what evaluation metrics are for. So execute the cell one, so we have the data and we can um, have a first look at confusion matrices. 
The concept of confusion matrices is at the foundation of a lot of different evaluation metrics. And a confusion matrix is just a cross tabulation of how much something occurs in one side and how much occurs on the other side. In our case, how much does it occur in the ground truth data and how much does it occur in the actual data? And we sort of have four different possibilities here how a single male can be classified. We either have a true positive, that means that the predicted label and the ground truth label are both positive, so our classifier was correct, and our classifier predicted positive, true positive. We can also have true negatives, which means that the actual label, so the ground truth, and our predicted label are both negative, so our classifier is correct and negative, true negative. And then we can get to the cases where our classifier is wrong. We can have the case that our classifier predicted a positive label, but the actual ground truth label is negative, so it's a false positive. And we have the case where our predicted label is negative, but the actual label is positive. So the mail was spam, but we didn't find it. This is called a false negative. Our confusion matrix is now just a cross tabulation of the four. So we have two rows and two columns here for the binary classification case. And each column contains positive and negative, true or false. And we can see that our cross tabulation here means true positive, both of these are positive. False negatives, predicted label is negative, but the actual label is positive. And the same down here. So this is our first exercise. And I think you haven't seen this before because the last NumPy notebook didn't have real exercises. This is the format that we will have exercises in throughout the rest of the semester. You have a written exercise text. In this case, complete the function below to calculate the confusion matrix based on the input true and predicted label, so the ground truth and our classifier prediction. And you, in almost all cases, also get a little hint at what the solution should look like. So this is called a remark. The output should be a two by two NumPy array with values corresponding to the picture above. So this picture right here. The function should throw an error if the input arrays are of different shapes. This specification is important. Um, because if we go back to our data, uh, wait, there it is, we can see that these are aligned. So we know that they have a one-to-one -one correspondence of samples. This right here corresponds to this, this corresponds to this. However, when this would have one more value, or in the multi-class classification case, um, different dimensions, we no longer have this one-to-one -one correspondence, so we don't really know how to match up labels. That's why we should always check first if our input arrays are of the same shape. And this is also a nice little repetition of both Python features and NumPy features. So the first line of code I'm going to write is a search that our true array, so the ground truth, the shape of that is the same as our predicted array. Assert in Python just means check whatever Boolean expression comes after and tell me if this is in case this is wrong. So this function will just throw an error um, if this is wrong. It will throw an assertion error. We could also do raise if you want to catch this later, but since we work in a notebook environment here and we absolutely never want this to occur, it's right as well. Then we can have a look. We want to have a two by two number array. And I'm just going to call this CM for a confusion matrix. And I'm going to instantiate a new zero array. Our shape, of course, should be two by two. And we want to have integers, so numpy.int c. This is optional. Um, the result shouldn't change. If you have float value here, just the default thing for numpy to allocate when you have zeros is a float value. We no, don't ever need the actual zeros, uh, the, the float um, values, so integers are fine for us. So we can specify this sort of as a repetition of our um, lab session. And now we need to fill this confusion matrix with actual values. So let's start in the top left, so 0, 0, where our true positives should be. I can comment this. This is a true positives. And this is equal to um, all the cases where 
this input array is true and this is also true. So let's build this from the ground up. We can check in how many cases this is. So let me clarify this further. They need to be true at the same location or at the same index. We could solve this in a loop, um, just looping from zero to whatever the length of the input array is and comparing every single value in both arrays at the same index and then maybe increment a counter variable um, to count these occurrences. However, this is quite slow, especially for larger um, arrays. So I'm going to show you the NumPy way of doing it using universal functions. As we have learned before, they are much faster because they can work in parallel. And comparing two things in this case is nothing different than just a logical AND. And we want to compare if y true is one and y predicted is one. This might seem confusing to you, but this will just yield you a array with true values if this array is actually one and false value if it's not. You could compare these directly. However, if we not only calculate true positives, but also true negatives, um, we sort of want to maybe invert the two values um, because this should now contain everything where this array is of the specified label. But later on, we are going to need this. So in order to have all of this in the same, written in the same way to make it more readable, I will also include this here, even though this will yield the same result since we work in the binary classification case. So this just gives us an array um, of where both of these input arrays are one. However, this cell should contain a number. Since we have an array, we can just call sum on it and it will add all the different values. And since the integer value for true is one and the integer value for zero is false, um, we can take this Boolean array here, sum it up to get the number of true values and write this back into our cell. And this would be the NumPy way of um, checking if two arrays are the same and counting how often they are. Okay, the same thing applies also to the false positives and we can copy this line over because most of it will stay the same. Um, we just have two modifications to make here. The first one is that we don't want the upper left cell, but the upper right cell. So we're going to increment the second dimension by one. And since we deal with false positives, that means that the actual label is zero, predicted zero. Uh, sorry, the other way around. The actual label, the ground truth label is zero, but our predicted is one. So we have a positive, but it's one. We want to have the y true array equal to zero, but the prediction array equal to one. And now we just repeat this process for the false negatives. False negatives are in the lower left. So um, we take the first index of the first dimension, the second row, and the zero index of the second dimension, so the first column. And here we compare if true is one and predicted is zero. And the final case, the true negatives, here we have the lower right cell, so one, one, and we want to compare if both of them are zero. Okay, so this is our confusion matrix. Of course, we still need to return it, and now we can check if it actually works. So we're going to call confusion matrix. Wait, there's a missing underscore here. Confusion matrix, and we're going to call it on y true and y predicted. Keep in mind that the order of this matters. Um, so if I would feed them in in the other way around, I would get an inverted matrix. And we have a name error. All right, this is called CM right here. Sorry for that. It's an easy fix though. And now we can see that we counted our different occurrences. We have apparently two true positives, one false positive, three th false negatives and four true negatives. Okay, so now we have a confusion matrix. Let's go ahead to the next exercise, which is accuracy. 
Accuracy is our first metric, and it's the ratio of true predictions, so the sum of true positives and true negatives, all the cases where our classificator was correct, either in the positive or negative case, to the total number of predictions made. And this gives us an overall impression of the correctness of our classifier. So our exercise here is to implement a function that gives us this ratio. And of course, we can reuse the contingency matrix function we um, formulated before. So I'm going to first call the confusion matrix on our true and predicted array. And then I'm just going to return the ratio of our true positives, so the upper left, plus the true negatives, so the lower right. This gives us the total number of true predictions, or correct predictions, I think would be the better term here. And we divide that by the total number. And the total number of our confusion matrix is just the sum of all values. So we can just use this numpy.sum function. I also see that I have a typo here. So let's go ahead and see what our accuracy here is. And, oh, wait, sorry. And I did the same error as before. Of course, this should be CA. And we see that in about 60% of the cases, or exactly 60% of the cases, our classifier makes the correct prediction. The question now is, is this good? And I would argue that 0 0.6 is not pretty good in the binary case, given that a random classifier just, just assigns any score, will achieve a score of about 0 0.5. So we are marginally better than random. here. However, we can also get a more detailed look by calculating precision. Accuracy gives us the overall sort of performance, and precision becomes interesting in cases where something depends on correct predictions being made. So for our problem statement, that would um, mean that we want our classifier to only classify things as spam mail if it's really sure about that. Because if it doesn't, if it just flags everything as a spam mail, we might delete mails that are actually important to us and thus miss it. Um, so we want our classifier to be correct if it's very sure about its decision. And this is reflected in a high precision score. Because precision is the ratio of true positives to predicted positives. So how many of our positive cases that our classifier put out are actually correct? In our problem statement, that would be the ratio of mails that are actually spam in the number of overall detected spam mails. Um, as before, we are going to implement this using our confusion matrix. So cm equals confusion matrix of y true and y predicted. And this time around, we're going to return the true positive rate. So this is the upper left cell divided by, we want the total predicted positives. Um, so we have our true positives and also our false positives because they are still positive predictions made by the classifier. We again need to call numpy.sum. So we, well, there are two options. I will spell them out both, but I will keep to the second option uh, for the rest of the notebook just to be consistent. The first option would be to explicitly get the values. So uh, we have zero, zero plus, uh, wait, I'm going to say my word again, this should be CM, um, zero, one, so our first column. Um, However, I can rewrite this in sort of more numpy-ish way, which will come in handy later if we deal about, uh, if we talk about multi-class classification. And I can explicitly get a slice of this first column. So this gives you a view of this numpy array with only the first column and every value of every row. And we sum this up, which is the equivalent to the term that was there before. 
see if this works. Precision score is true and predicted. Oh, wait, it was called precision score. And we can see that we got a little bit better. Precision is 0 0.66. So our accuracy doesn't tell us the whole picture and precision gives us a bit more detailed information about the actual behavior of our classification uh, algorithm. However, also precision doesn't tell us the whole picture because recall is another very important metric. Recall tells us the ratio of true positives to actual positives. So in our problem setting with the spam classification, this would be the ratio of males that are correctly classified as spam to the overall number of males that are spam in our test data. So precision tells us about the correct ratio in our predicted data, and recall tells us about our ratio of correctness with respect to the underlying test data. If we apply this to the spam mail um, scenario, it would be important that we correctly classify a large number or kinds of males. So if we have a model that fails to detect spam very often, it is correct in most of its decisions. It would reach a very high precision, but it's not useful as we have many cases of spam that are being missed by the classifier and our inbox would just start to fill up. So a very high recall is also desirable for us um, for our classification algorithm. Same as before, we are going to implement this recall score using our uh, confusion matrix. So first build that of y2 and y predicted. And now for recall, we want the true positives compared to the actual positives, which looks really similar to our precision score because we still have zero, zero here. However, and I'm going to keep writing it as the numpy sum way, you can also do the explicit sum here um, of the first right, column, uh, of the first row, sorry. So this gives us every first value in the, um, yeah, this just gives us the first row. Okay, so this is our recall score. And we can, of course, also have a look at what it puts out for our test data. And we can see that our recall is 0 0.4. So our classifier is judging from the precision and recall scores, classifies quite well. If it finds spam mail, in most cases it's correct but it tends to miss a lot of spam. So it's not a useful spam filter. But we don't always want to compare these two values. Sometimes we want to have a singular value that sort of incorporates both the notion of precision and recall. And that is where the F1 score comes into play. Because precision and recall are a trade-off. I can get a very high precision, but this will always or in almost all cases lead to a degradation in recall. And a very high recall is also trivial to reach. I can just flag every incoming mail as spam, and I will have detected every single spam mail. However, I also do a lot of false classification, so my precision really goes down. If on the other hand, and this would be example here, if our spam classifier only detects mails that, for example, congratulate you on your billions Google search and prompt you to claim your prize by entering your and our social security number, it would be correct in these cases, but this is only a very small subset of spam mail. So the precision would be very high, but the recall would be very low. So you have to sort of strike a balance between the two. And the more you optimize towards one direction, the more you potentially use in the other direction. One metric that integrates both values into one single score is the F1 score. And the F1 score is the harmonic mean between precision and recall. So if we define precision as P and recall as R, our F1 score would be two times P times R divided by P plus R. And this is exactly what we're going to implement in the next exit. As before, we're going to calculate the F1 score. Um, and different to before, we can rely on our um, implementations of precision and recall. We can do P equals precision score, Y2, Y predicted, and recall is our recall score, Y2 and Y predicted. 
And then our f1 score, as we saw before in the formula, is just 2 times pre precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. And here we can also test this. So F1 score of Y2 and Y false. Ah, uh, wait, no, Y predicted, sorry. And we can see that we have a 0 0.5 F1 score, which means our classifier, um, if we look at before, it, our recall value was 0 0.4. Our precision value was a bit higher than 0 0.6. So this is sort of, since it's a harmonic mean, it's somewhere in the middle between the two. Okay, this gives us um, different things to play around with. And we also want to compare them to the reference function of sklearn. I'm going to copy this code in because this is something, as you remark, Chris, where you can just play with a lot of different scores. Um, do this on your own time. I will just keep it short for this video. Uh, copy this in and we can see that actually our implementation matches. So this line right here is the our custom implementation. This line right here is the reference implementation by sklearn and we can see that we are um, correct. This is sort of the unit test or manual unit test to check if we do the same thing. And this will be done throughout the semester whenever we, for example, program linear regression, we will compare our output to sklearn to make sure that what we did is correct. And this is something that uh, I also advise you to do while you're developing things without jumping into the solution we provide. First, check if your output matches sklearn and try to fiddle around with the values or your code a bit to get closer to the actual um, reference before having a look at the solution, sort of to spark your own problem finding skills. Okay, I also invite you to put a few different true and predicted scores in here. So you can always redefine your y true and y false up here and see how having different scores, for example, more false positives or more true negatives or something like that would impact all the different scores and how they are interlaced. And you will probably find that um, precision and recall form a trade-off in many cases. Okay, the second half, as promised, is about multi-class classification. And multi-class classification here in the context of this notebook means that each male can now receive one and only one of four different labels. It can be a normal male, it can be an important male, it can be an unimportant male, or it can be a spam male. And below we have uh, 20 example mails, so a bit more than before, and each of them, as you can see, is classified with a different of these four classes. So, for example, our first mail would be an important one, our second mail is just a normal email, then we have a spam mail over, wait, over here and an unimportant one over here, and this is again our um, ground truth label. So, we can see that again, in some cases, we match this, in some cases, we greatly misclassify something. The question now is how do we calculate precision recall and F1 score using this new kind of multi-class data? And again, we can modify the concept of confusion matrices to also be applicable to multi-class settings. However, there's a little twist. And that is that these true positive, false positive, false negative, and true negative rates are now defined per class only. So I can only calculate a true positive rate for either the normal class or the unimportant class or the, unimpor uh, or the important class or the spam class. I don't have an overall true positive rate, for example, anymore. I have four true positive rates because I have four classes. I also have four false positive rates. So our confusion matrix has the shape n times n, where n is the number of classes. And I need to do a little bit more guesswork on how to infer the actual um, class-specific rates from that. I will show you how the matrix looks like. Um, so before we had true and false, or positive and negative. Now, because it was only two classes, so you can sort of, if you only look at the upper left for 
things here, this would be our old thing if class one is true and class two is false. However, since we have more classes, we also have more rows and more columns. And we now count if something has the prediction of class one, then, and also has the ground truth value of one. I only have one example here. However, three samples have class one as a predicted and class two as the actual. And if I now have a look, I can see that all my true positives, for example, are along the diagonal of this matrix. So wherever the same class is predicted in both actual and predicted data. The false positives are the row-wise sum minus the true positives. So for class two, a false positive is anything that is flagged as class two, but is not class two in the ground truth data. So for example, if I predicted class two, but it's actually class one, that's a false positive. If I predicted class two and I have actually class three, that's also a false positive. And so these three yellow cells together, so the row-wise sum of this class minus the true positive rate or the diagonal makes up our false positive. The same thing is for the false negative, except now it's the column. So wherever something is actually class two, but predicted as something else, same concept as for false positive applies, just sort of flipped by 90 degrees. And the two negatives are just every other value that is not already contained in these values before. And you can imagine sliding, sort of sliding this over the matrix to get the values for every single class. So for example, for class one, my green cell would be here. These would be my three blue cells and these would be my three yellow cells. And these nine over here would be red. For class um, three, uh, sorry, for class three, yes. This would be the green cell. This would be the three blue cells. These would be the three yellow cells. And this right here would be red. So let's build this confusion matrix for multi-class classification. And here, again, I'm going to write a matrix. And first, I again make sure that both of my matrices are of the same shape. Uh, sorry, dot shape equals my predicted dot shape. And now I also have to find out what my classes are because I need to compare them later. So I'm going to say classes equals np.unique, which will give me the unique values of something. So if I have a large array with numbers from zero to 10, it will give me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, and I want to have the, all the unique values or unique classes in my ground truth data. So the y2 array. Also, I'm going to need the number of classes in some instances. So I'm just going to save it to an extra variable. And this will be the length of the classes array. Now I know how much and what classes I have, and I can con begin continue uh, begin building my confusion matrix. So cm as before equals numpy dot zeros. So I want to have it empty as a start. And now I don't have the uh, two by two shape anymore, but num classes by num classes. So n times n for n classes. In our case, it will be four by four. And again, I'm just going to uh, save it as an integer. Now I actually need loops um, because I want to iterate over all my different classes. And I also want to have the index. I will type out the line and then explain what each part of this line does. So this right here is my number array that holds my different classes. And in our case, it will be one, two, three, four. And this enumerate iterates over this array and tells me the index of each value. So I get the index zero, one, two, three, and the class one, two, three, four. This is important because I, I could also just deduct one and get the same value back. But think about the case where your classes are not one, two, three, four, but for example, A, B, C, D. 
Um, so you can't use the numerical features of the classes, but you also want to allocate the correct cell in our confusion matrix. So the first class gets index zero, the second index one, and so on. I want to compare every class to every, every class to every other class. So I'm going to have an inner loop, which has j and cj, which is again just our classes. So this is sort of the cross product of classes with itself, and I also get the indices here in every iteration. And now I can allocate the cell i, j. So for class 1, it will be the 0, 0. For class 1 compared to class 2, it will be 0, 1. For class 1 compared to class 3, it will be 0, 3, and so on. And this is equal to a sum. And as before, we can use np logical and to calculate the number of um, agreement. So we want to have the predicted class equal to ci, and we want to have the actual class equal to cj, and we want to count how many they are. So we use this logical and in some construct as we did before in the binary case. And that's it. This is our uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is our confusion matrix code. And if I don't have a typo, we can see that. Wait, I think I forgot to execute my new data. Yep. Which gives us a nice little hint that I was going to mention later, but since it's here now, anyways, this confusion matrix generalizes a concept. So. Binary classification is a subtype of multi-class classification, just with two classes. So this code will also work for binary classification. And here we have the same thing as before, because we still had our binary data loaded in. Now that I have new um, y2 and y pred for um, multi-class classification, this will change. And we can see that now we have a 4 by 4 matrix with all the different values um, accounted for here. Okay, now I mentioned that we have true positive, false positive rates um, for every single class. And the desirable thing here is that we want to have an overall score. So the question becomes, how do we combine these class individual scores into one single overall score? We want to average them somehow. And there are two ways of doing averaging. We have micro-averaging and macro-averaging. In micro-averaging, we collect the decisions or so the classifications for all classes into a single confusion matrix. So we would, for example, sum all the true positives, sum all the false positives, sum all the false negatives and all the true negatives, and then have this sort of reduced uh, matrix that we can just use our functions as before, or precision we call it. Um, in macro averaging, on the other hand, we compute the metric for each class separately. So we compute a precision score for class one, we compute a precision class for uh, precision score for class two, and so on. And then we take the mean of all these different computed values. The two strategies here produce slightly different scores, and they also say slightly different things about our data. So micro averaging um, is desirable in any case where you might have class imbalance because the resulting performance is based on the proportion of every class. If I sum up all the true positives, I get the overall number that is accounted for in proportion to every class. So if I have, for example, three classes and 90% of my data is are class one, and all of these are correct, my result will be um, accounting for this large imbalance between the classes. Macro-averaging, on the other hand, doesn't take this imbalance into account because we compute a precision score for every single class and then do the mean. And within the mean, every class has the same sort of influence. So macro-averaging makes sense uh, wherever you want to give equal weight to different classes independently from their proportion in the data. So let's start with precision. This exercise is now a bit longer because we want to write a function that computes precision as before, but we have an extra parameter given here. And this should dictate if we want to do micro-averaging 
macro averaging, or as in this case here, if none is specified, we just want to return the per class metric array. So how do we implement this? This remark is, gives you a hint already um, that we can actually do all of the calculations simultaneously using vectorized functions. And the first thing I'm going to need is, of course, again, our confusion matrix. Q and Y predicted. And now I first want to calculate my true positive rate. And if I just quickly go back to the graphic here. I explained to you before that the diagonal holds all the true positives for the class. So this cell is the true positive for class one, this cell is the true positive for class two, this cell is the true, and so on and so forth. So instead of calculating the true positive for every class, we can just take the diagonal. Ah, uh, wait, not numpy, but cm dot diagonal. And this gives us all the values along the diagonal of our matrix, which are exactly the four true positive rates that we want to have. Now the false positive, let's go back to the picture one more time. Wait. The false positive, as I talked before, is just these three values, but this will shift for a different class. So for class one, it would be these three values. For class two, it's the marked in yellow. For class three, I have one, two, three, and for class four, I have one, two, three. And this just means that I can take the row-wise sum of my matrix and deduct the diagonal, and this will give me the false positive rate. So to implement this, I can take the row-wise sum, which means cm dot sum, but only along the row axis, so x plus equals one, minus, I could write cm diagonal here, but this is actually just our true positive rate. So I can just save me some computation time and reuse the value that I calculated up here. Okay, so now I have these two values that I need to calculate precision. And if you wonder why we start with precision, I will tell you now that there is no accuracy value for multi-class classification. But you take a second to think about why that is um, sort of an exercise left to the reader and try to come up why we can't define accuracy in multi-class classification. Okay, so we're not going to address this average parameter. We do just a simple switch. So if our average mode is micro, right, let me do the proper way of having spaces here and um, that. And for micro, we want to first sum all our values together and then calculate the matrix. If you recall, this is an array of four different true positive values. So I can just take the sum of that array and that will give me the overall number of true positives. And this then gets divided by the sum of true positives plus the sum of false positives. And this basically reduces to our original uh, precision formula also in the binary case. If I want to have Marco averaging, I am going to do this slightly differently. So for Marco averaging, I'm, I'm, this line will be complete in a second, but let's uh, don't omit the return here. Um, if I just write this as before, this is actually vectorized internally because these are all four values. This sum also is four different sums because the first entry of this will get added to the first entry of this, the second to the second, the third to the third, and the fourth to the fourth. And then division works the same way. We divide the first value of this true positive array by the first value in the sum. And so our result of this computation are four individual values. This is precision for every class. Actually, let's copy that. Um, and if we just take the average, average of these four values, so numpy.average, we get our macro precision. 
However, I also want to have this fallback case if I don't specify neither micro or macro, I just want to return the individual per class scores. So that's why I copied this before. And this will just return the vectorized array. Let's try this out. So precision score of y true, y predicted. And we can see here that if I don't supply any micro or macro, I can see this array, uh, the vectorized sort of computation of precision. And I can see that I actually have very different precisions over all my classes. I have one class with, which is perfectly detected, class four. I have one that is sort of okayish and two that are quite bad. I can also specify that I want to have average equals micro, which will give us a micro position, which is 0.3 over all. Or we can also have the macro position. One extra exercise here, I want you to think about what this means if my macro precision is larger than my micro precision. Okay, let's do the same thing for recall. Again, I'm going to, wait, let's actually copy all of this over so that I don't have to type it out again, but don't worry, I will explain everything in detail. It's to save me some typing. Because both concepts are really similar. We also need the confusion matrix. We also need the true positive rate. So we take our diagonal again. The only difference is that we don't want the false positives, but instead we want the false negatives. So how do we get these? Let's jump back to the picture. As you can see, the false negatives are the columns. So if I just take the sum of column one, column two, column three, and column four individually, and deduct, of course, my true positive diagonal, I get my overall numbers of false negative for every single class. And I can just do this by modifying this axis argument. So now I just do axis zero and I get my column-wise sum. And then the rest of the code, everything stays the same. This computation is still similar. I just have to exchange my false positives for my false negatives. And now I have the complete recall function. Of course, we're still going to test this. So recall score of um, y true and y predicted. We can see that we have, again, individual class scores. If we don't specify anything, if we do average class, uh, equals micro, we have a single score or macro, we get another score. Also, again, here, think about what it means if my macro score is larger than my micro score of recall. Finally, the only thing that's left to do is F1 score. And there's not much to do here, because as before, we are going to just call our precision and recall um, functions as we defined before. So y true and y predicted. And also, I have to now hand down the average argument. And the same for recall. And then I want to compute the harmonic mean. So as before, I have two times precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. And the nice thing here is that it doesn't matter what these return because if we do average equals none, this will return an array of four values. This will also return a val uh, an array of four values. And NumPy is smart enough to figure out that if these are singular values, that this will produce a singular score. If these are arrays of the same shape, all of these operations here will get broadcasted. So I also get an array of the same shape as a result. So I get uh, my per class F1 score if I don't specify any averaging. We can try that out by typing y true and y predicted and see that, again, this works flawlessly. And if we want to have averaging, we can do micro or macro. Okay, as before, let's check if we are correct. And I will once again copy in some code because this is just for visuals. I invite you to try around with your own data and your own implementation to see how you can change different uh, data things, um, what results you will get if the um, 
or different averaging schemes. So here I think I used macro and everything except F1. Um, or different values influences. You can see that our implementation is correct, but of course, uh, play around a bit and see. Um, so since these are the same, let's compare quickly. If I put micro in the first column, which is in this row right here, and micro in every second one, uh, sorry, we can see that our uh, macro scores are slightly higher than our micro scores. Again, think about why this could be the case. That's all for now. Thank you for your attention and see you next week.